we're going to be talking about uh, the electron. But before we can get to the electron, why don't we start at the scientific method? We, we've got something so fundamentally wrong about the uh, scientific method. And here's an example. You know, it's uh, from this organization. I just found it random. Not that I look for them. But I found it about random. Here's what they say, okay? Puts in, uh, everything in the proper light. Or, Organization for Autism uh, Research. And it says, when confronted with claims that are presented as true, such as the doctor's belief, how can we make a reasonable evaluation to ascertain as confidently as possible whether the claim has merit? Uh -huh. Claims abound from alien abductions and the existence of Loch Ness Monster to eating wild boar meat to cure uh, uh, autism. How can we separate the wheat from the chaff in a way that both prevents the acceptance of wildly suspicious claims that have no support and permits adoption with some level of certainty and comfort of claims that are likely to, in fact, be true? The best, way we, uh, the, the best way known to evaluate claims is to adopt the intellectual discipline of science and the scientific method of investigation. Okay, let's see what that's all about. It says, this methodology involves carefully defining terms, which no one in mathematics does, no one in biology does, we don't have a definition for life yet, no one in paleontology does, we don't have a definition of what a mass, ex a, a mass extinction and background extinction are, and for sure we have no definitions at all in mathematical physics, not one. Not one that we can sink our teeth in. So I don't know what this involves carefully defining terms means or what they're talking about. Uh, they continue conducting controlled experiments when possible. Why do we need to con conduct an experiment to give an explanation? I mean, if you want to conduct an experiment, go ahead. But what's that got to do with science? Science is the explanation, not, the, not doing experiments. Practicing the law of parsimony and adopting philosophic doubt or skepticism. Skepticism? Doubt? Is that science? I mean, you can doubt all you want, but that's got to do with belief, with religion, not with uh, explanation. Okay? Although all the methods of science are important, practicing skepticism is crucial to protecting oneself from believing unsubstantiated claims. Yeah, you're talking about belief. You're not talking about explaining rationally and objectively. So again, people have this notion that science is about belief that it's got to do with proof, with presenting evidence, with doing experiments to present evidence so that you can prove, so that you can convince and convert the jury. That's not science. That's called religion. That's called belief. Okay, That's opinion. Right now, uh, people are mistaken if they think that's the scientific method. No, science is not about belief. Okay, That's mathematics. The mathematical physics, that's about belief. You know, they, they give you a rotten explanation, an idiotic explanation. They say, believe it. Why should I believe it? Well, because we did the test. We did the experiment. We proved it. Here's the equation. We have repeatable experiments. We can predict what's going to happen, and therefore we know. And you say, well, hold it. Okay, you did all that, and you're telling me that a particle can be at two places at once. That's your explanation. Or you're telling me the Earth drags space-time, four-dimensional space-time around itself. Those are the conclusions. Those are the theories. You want me to believe in that? Okay, so we have a problem. You know, science is not about belief. Okay, that's only in mathematics. That's where they talk about belief and proof and evidence and running experiments. In science, we don't do that. Science, specifically in physics, we talk about explanation. You have to have an objective explanation for how something works in the invisible world of Mother Nature's out there. Okay, uh, so here we have a couple of uh, altar boys and you know uh, these uh, choir boys that go to college and they get their PhDs. Why do they get their PhDs? Because they suck up, essentially. That's what it amounts to. In other words, how do you get a PhD? Well, for that, you have to have an advisor. And you better follow the rules of the advisor because otherwise he's not going to advise you. <laughs> okay, He's not going to be your supervisor. So you better more or less be in line with what he already believes. And so whatever uh, paper you're going to write about, whatever your PhD is going to be about, you're going to write whatever he told you or more or less it's going to be in line with your supervisor. And what this guarantees is that from generation to generation to degeneration, what we have is all these people learning the same thing and just going on a single tangent. Okay? So if you get it wrong from the start, if you get it wrong from Niels Bohr or from Albert Einstein, well, the next generation gets it wrong from them because they have to bow down to Einstein and Bohr. And what about the next generation? Well, they get it wrong from, from those who got it wrong from Einstein and Bohr and so on down the line. And so, yeah, here you have these, uh, this group of... Um, uh, choir boys, you know, I think you recognize some of them, and, uh, and these are the ones who follow and just repeat what they learned by rote. So they had to learn by rote in order to get their PhDs, otherwise they wouldn't have gotten their PhDs. And, you know, once they got their PhDs, all they can do is just make a career out of it, and hopefully get into, like these folks do, get into the 
limelight, you know, get it out there so that people see them and go on television, you know, do some uh, Hollywood stuff. And that makes them more famous. They make a lot of money. And what do they talk about? They talk about the same nonsense that everybody else does. And they talk about the same nonsense that they inherited from their forefathers, whom they learned from by rote. And who did their forefathers learn from? They learned it by rote from the previous generation, down the line and down the line and down the line. And that's all we have right now. Okay? And so we're not going to get any new ideas if all these people are just repeating what their uh, PhD uh, supervisors uh, approve okay? and coach them on. That's the issue. And so what do these people believe in? What, 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 are the, you know, what's, what are the main points that you see out there that, that these choir boys repeat by, you know, by rote? Uh, they, they repeat it as parrots, but like if they memorize the poetry. And these are some examples here, okay? The black hole, singularity, okay? Everybody talks about those. those that's a big subject today. Big Bang, lots of people investigating that, okay? Uh, then you have transfer of energy there, you know, transfer of info, information. So we're transferring concepts, okay, all these ghosts and spirits that they transfer around, concepts that they turn into objects, particles at two places at once. You know, there you have the COVID, you know, bug, it's two places at once, I guess, right? Uh, wave particle duality, you know, you can't even imagine this thing that turns into what is known as a wave packet. No one can draw it. One tried there, it's a little arrow with a curticue around it. That's, by the way, from... Uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Roger Penrose, <laughs> that's how he visualizes the wave packet, whatever that is, that little curly cue. I mean, what's that arrow? I mean, uh, light has a little arrow at the end of it. Is, is that what, it, what <laughs> light looks like? I mean, all these people have to be kidding me, okay? And so, yeah, they, all they do is just keep repeating what the previous generation fed to them. And so, you know, a lot of these PhDs, you wonder, you know, what do they know? They know equations, yeah, because that's something you repeat. You can do the equation. You understand it just by looking at the variables there. No problem. Uh, that's a language. But from there to extrapolate that, now you can understand how the universe works, meaning the explanation of the mechanisms. Well, that's a, a big step for mankind, okay? <laughs> okay, so uh, I think they're stretching uh, their, uh, their research a little too far. Okay, so uh, here we have, uh, Paul says, along those same lines, says, energy definition is capacity to do work. Aha, uh -huh, capacity to do work. Okay, so therefore, it is not a standalone object, right? Because you're saying it's capacity. We can't say that energy is a physical object because if energy is capacity, obviously there's no physical object called capacity. Okay, uh, and so uh, it's not a standalone object either under the see touch definition of mathematical physics. Because if an object is that which you can see, touch, hopefully you cannot see or touch capacity because it's a concept. So even under the mathematical definition, uh, energy is not a physical object. And obviously it's not under science, okay, because uh, under science it's uh, shape. An object is that which has shape. And so you don't, energy, neither energy nor capacity has shape. So it bumps out under both definitions as an object, okay? So let's make sure we, we cover that, you know, dot that I and that, cross that T, right? Cover that base. And uh, uh, then so it's irrational to say that we're going to transfer capacity, okay? Because what is capacity? Well, there you have the definition. Amount that something can contain or produce, ability to contain amount in, uh, or number that can be contained, okay? So uh, that's what capacity is. It represents a concept, talking about quantities, okay? And so, yeah, uh, we cannot say that energy, if energy is capacity, that energy is a physical object. So we cannot talk about transferring energy, which is... A uh, famous phrase of mathematical physics, they say, oh, we're going to transfer capacity, transfer energy, transfer information. <laughs> yeah, how do you transfer information? <laughs> you carry it with your hands? Does it drip through your fingers? I mean, how do you do it with uh, information? And along the same line, Fowler says, a field is an interaction of energy with materials. Now, if energy is capacity and capacity is not a physical object, meaning energy is not a physical object, how can it interact with anything? I mean, what do we have? Interaction of uh, concepts? We have love hitting intelligence. Is that what we have here? One hitting the other one? I mean, what do you mean interaction of energy with materials, meaning matter, meaning things, I guess, right? I'm assuming that's what he means by material. Okay. And uh, so here's my answer to that, again, leading to uh, where we're headed, right? Uh, field is not a, a thing. So it's a quantity represented by a number that has a value for each point in space and time. 
So no, a field, you know, let's put his definition here. A field is an interaction, he says, uh, of energy. No, that's not what a field is. And uh, he should look up the definition. He'll find it. Uh, this one comes from the Wikipedia, but you'll find almost the same definition everywhere out there. And what you find is that, yeah, it's a quantity. That's what a field is. It's a bunch of numbers of value at each point in space and time, you know, as defined by mathematical physics. And when you look up each one of those numbers there, you, uh, each one of those words there, like number, value, point, and space, and time, well, you find those definitions, none of which are, a, uh, none of them are a single, uh, not a single one of them is a number, uh, is, a, is an object, is a thing, okay? They're all concepts. And so field is a concept. And again, if it's a quantity of whatever, then it's got to be a concept, okay? So you cannot say that, you know, that uh, you're going to have a field that does this and does that. You can't treat field as a physical object because obviously field is an abstract mathematical concept. There is no physical standalone object called field. But these people have been brainwashed so much by uh, mathematical physics when they were first in high school, maybe in college, and they just keep repeating, oh, energy, we transfer energy. Oh, field, it's, the field is shaking, it's vibrating, it's, it's excited, it's in the excited field. There's no such thing. These are uh, euphemisms, figures of speech. You can't use those to do uh, physical mechanisms in physics, to explain objectively a mechanism, like you would explain how a car works or, or how a scooter runs or whatever. Okay? You can't do that with, you can't use these words to explain a mechanism. That's the issue. Okay, uh, and the fellow continues, he says, mass is a measure of how many atoms, uh, and okay, and then he says, we use scales, meaning to measure. I put that in there, the to measure, okay? Therefore, mass result should be specified in number of atoms, right? Okay, because if uh, mass is a measure of how many atoms, okay, then uh, either it's a measure or it's the number of atoms. One of the two. It can't be both. Okay, so either mass is a, how many atoms, in which case you get a specified in number of atoms, meaning that there you have an example. Uh, if you have a mass of one trillion atoms, then, then you could say, yeah, this has a mass of one trillion atoms. You can't say it has one kilogram because one kilogram is not the same thing as a million atoms or a trillion atoms or whatever. You know, you, you got to specify the, the result, your value, your, 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 your ending uh, thing uh, for mass as a number. You got to say 10 atoms, 5 atoms, 500 atoms, a trillion atoms or whatever. That's how you have to specify mass. You can't say it's a kilogram because that's weight. Okay? And you say, well, that's an ordinary speech notion of, of weight. Well, again, what did you do? You put it on a scale. That's what you did. But to count atoms, you don't need to put them on a scale. What you need is just an abacus. You don't, you don't put them on a scale. Okay, So this is how simple it is. Either mass is the quantity of matter, or it's a measure of a quantity of matter. But if it's a measure of a quantity of matter, you're talking about weight, because now you're saying how much each atom weighs. You're going to weigh the thing on a scale, like you say there. If you put it on a scale, now you're measuring its weight. Okay, So a kilogram is a weight. Not only <laughs> in ordinary speech, it's also for mathematical physics. Okay, because what you're doing is you're gonna uh, you're gonna state your your value, your final result. You're gonna state one trillion atoms. You're gonna say that's one kilogram. No, one kilogram is the pull of gravity on that on those trillion atoms. That's what a uh, that's what uh, you measure there with a scale. So if you put it on a scale, you're measuring the weight. Okay, and you can't say well weight is something else because it weighs different on the moon. Yeah, because the attraction of gravity on the moon over each one of those particles is different. That's the only reason. Okay, but otherwise uh, mass has nothing to do with it. Mass is the quantity of atoms. Stated in quantity of atoms, say one trillion atoms. Very simple. All you got to do is use an abacus, not a scale. Very simple. And mass is not an object according to the C-touch criteria of mathematical physics. Remember, because if, if, if you're going to talk about uh, whether you measure or whether you, know, you weigh it or you count atoms, either way, if mass is either one of those two, mass is not a physical object. Because you're not talking about the object per se. You're talking about how much it weighs or how many atoms you count it. Neither one of those qualifies as a, as a physical object, standalone physical object. And certainly you can't touch quantity if that's what uh, mass is, a quantity, right? You can't touch the number five, okay? Well, that one you can. <laughs> but I mean, you know, the number five represents a concept, an abstract concept, mathematical concept. You can't touch abstract mathematical concepts. I can't touch threes, five, fours. I can't touch numbers, okay? You can only touch it when you put it on the, on the paper and then you're touching the paper and the ink. <laughs> And so mass is not an object according to that, and it's also not according to the definition of science, which is that which has shape. A uh, definition that destroys all religions. Okay? And people, of course, uh, religious people are very upset about that. They don't like um, you um, destroying their religion. So they fight it you know, with tooth and nail because they realize their religious is on the rock, <laughs> on the rocks. Okay, let's move on here. 
And uh, here we have Fa, who says, again, leading to what we're going to get to, which is the electron, okay? All this has to do with it. Uh, here we have, what is resistance, the Fa says. This is in relation to what I talked about the other day. A measure of the amount of work, this is what he says, required to transfer electrical energy through a medium. My God, how do you transfer energy through any medium if energy is not a physical object, like we just stated? Okay, so they have this ghost, this spirit, which is a concept that they turn into an object, and they talk about transferring energy through a medium. I mean, through water, through space. Is space a medium? Or maybe it's a non-medium. And they're going to transfer this energy, whatever that is, which is a concept. So, so they start off on the wrong foot because they're using the wrong language. They have to get away from the mathematical language. You can't use field. You can't use the word energy. You can't use the word mass. Not in science. Okay, that's in religion. You can use those words. Okay, not in physics. Okay, and so question, he says, is the resistance in a vacuum proportional to the distance between the anode and cathode? Uh-huh. So we're going to concede that we have this thing called energy, and he's going to talk about the resistance in the vacuum, that the energy, whatever, I guess he's talking about the electrons, which is what I talked about the other day, because we're talking about resistance. Resistance to what? To electron flow. Okay, so he's saying, is there a resistance in the vacuum? Okay, and he says, this is a question of distance. Okay, a lot of people have this in the back of their minds that maybe it's got to do with distance because if you, you know, turn on the, the pressure or the, the, the flow, whatever, then you have these electrons flowing through space and they might reach the, the anode, right? So you have the, these little electron balls, think of them as electron balls, right? Uh, corpuscles, they're flying through the air or through the vacuum, okay? There's no resistance there. They're flying through the vacuum and they don't go that far because they fall before they reach, you know, the, the other shore. But if you hit them harder enough, you know, then maybe they do reach the uh, anode, meaning that they were able to uh, reach the other shore, but it's a question of distance, because the farther you got it, the more you have to push them to reach that point. That's what he's saying. This is his logic. And a lot of people have the same logic. They're saying, oh, you have to push the electrons harder in order for the electron to reach the cathode. That's all you gotta do in a vacuum, okay? That's, that's the setup, okay, what these people are thinking, okay? If so, how, how is long-distance communication through space affected by resistance, not just by the inverse square law, okay? And he does uh, say that, you know, is, there a, uh, is the resistance in a vacuum proportional to the distance between the anode and the cathode? Okay, let's end. This is an important question, okay, because a lot of people, I think, think in these same terms, okay? They, they, they're thinking, oh, it's so far away, you just need to push it harder. So let's go in steps here to find out what's happening to the electrons, okay? as they go through the vacuum, because that's the issue. That's how uh, quantum visualizes this. Quantum has gotten rid of the atom. It just does electricity with electrons. And so does the electric universe, by the way. You know, they say, oh, we have all this electron, the electron flow, that's electricity. So they got rid of the atom. They're not even paying attention to the atom anymore. They're not thinking that there's a row of atoms from here to the other galaxy through which the electrons travel from atom to atom. They're not thinking about that. They're saying, oh, the electron beads just fly to the other side. Okay, no, no atoms in between. There's no bridge. Okay, it's just the electrons just flying through the vacuum. That's the notion all these people have. Okay, let's get that right. Okay, and so here we have uh, essentially that setup. We're saying, okay, well, here we have the electrons, and they're moving from one uh, terminal to the other, okay, from uh, cathode to anode. We're just going to go with this flow, okay? And so the question is whether if that's vacuum, total vacuum that we have there, that black stuff, uh, that means there's nothing there. What is vacuum? Vacuum is the absence of an object. In other words, vacuum is that which has no shape. So we have absolutely nothing there. The only objects there are the ones you see, the yellow ones. Those are the electron beads, okay? They're coming out of the atoms and somehow flowing, and we call this flow of electrons. We're going to call that electricity. Does electricity flow through the vacuum without any atoms in between? That's the question. Or do we have to have atoms? Do the electrons have to go from atom to atom? Okay, so we have a difference between these two scenarios. Here you have atoms, so you have the electron going from atom to atom in the conduction uh, uh, zone, okay? And here you have them without the atom. They just go through the vacuum without any need for uh, a bridge, for anything through which uh, they can, you know, jump from one atom to the uh, next. Okay, so these are the two scenarios. And the question is, can we do electricity in the vacuum, total vacuum? Just sending electron beads, discrete electron beads. Remember, the beads are not tied to one another. Okay? And so these beads, for some reason, are pushed like from a cannon 
Okay, and so the beats are going, bah, 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 bah. it's like a machine gun shooting bullets. And so the bullets are going one right behind the other. They're all individual. One is not tied to the other. That means if you move your gun, uh, the, the spray, the, the bullets are going to be like a, um, you know, like uh, if, if you move your hose, right, with the water squirting out, they're going to describe a curve. If you move your machine gun, the bullets are not going to go straight. Only if you keep that machine gun perfectly straight will the bullets go one right after another, you can say. But if you're going to move that machine gun, the bullets are going to, you know, have a, um, a, a curve. They're going to describe a curve. Okay, so keep those two things in mind. Okay, but here we have um, a situation. We have Cannonball Man. Okay, Cannonball Man. He wants to reach the other shore. Okay, but it turns out he's not, uh, not going to uh, power his, um, his cannon strong enough. So the cannon shoots him. But it's not strong enough, so he ends up in the water, okay? So he doesn't end up on the other shore. Why? Because the cannon is not powerful enough or doesn't have the uh, power, uh, the might. It doesn't uh, really um, create such an impulse on him to, to make it to the other shore. So how do we reach the other shore? Well, we have to increase the power or the impulse, right? So now the guy uh, puts a little more power in there. Now he can reach the other shore, okay? Great. Okay, so now we made it to the other shore. Why? Because the cannon is pushing him but people have to understand that in this scenario you have two issues one is gravity and the other one is uh friction you have the friction with the air and with anything else that might be in the air okay but specific, specifically the air and then you have gravity but see we're, the scenario we were discussing just now was in outer space where there's absolutely nothing so if if i'm gonna shoot electrons right if i'm gonna let me get rid of this one if I'm going to shoot electrons out of my cannon, and I'm going to shoot them in outer space where there's nothing between two galaxies, for example, there's nothing there in between, okay? The electrons have nothing to stop them because there's nothing there to stop them. So that electron can go all the way to the other side of the universe if it wants to, unless gravity or some object interferes uh, with their trajectory. So if we have two galaxies, we have total empty space, that electron should reach the other side. Should We should have electricity across the universe because all we're sending is the electron. We don't need any atoms, remember that, according to quantum mechanics and the electric universe. We can send those electrons, and, and it's not a question of how much force the cannon uh, has. You can, you can tip it like that if you want. That electron, once, once it starts rolling, there's nothing to stop it. Why would it stop? Why, why would you need to give it more push if there's nothing that's causing friction on that electron and there's no gravity other than maybe your little gun. Let's assume you're in the middle of space, you shoot that electron, right? Well, you know, you don't have enough gravity to pull it back. And so that thing is going to go. In fact, it, it might even be pulled from the front from a galaxy, which has a little more influence than you who are out there, you know, in the middle of nowhere. So that electron should go to the galaxy. It doesn't matter if you hit it with a paddle or you just tip it with your little finger. It's going to roll all the way to the other side because there's nothing to stop it. So in a vacuum, if quantum mechanics is correct, if uh, um, electric universe are correct, you know, an electron should, should not be stopped by anything. No friction, no gravity. And that electron should just go on and on and on and on. It doesn't need a bigger cannon to shoot it across the river, you know, from one bank to another. That's my argument. Okay. So here we have it. Here, let's illustrate that so that you are aware illustrate that what I'm talking about here you have one galaxy and you're in the middle of space you're far away from the two galaxies but you're just going to shoot with whatever you've got there a little cathode and you're going to shoot it to the anode which is on the other side those electron beads are going to move through space because there's nothing to, to uh, stop it so you don't need more power you don't need more voltage or anything like that all you need is a big cannon or even not even a big cannon you can hit one electron bead with your little tip of your finger and it should reach the other end without any problem because that's what electricity is the flow of electron beads you have nothing to stop the electron bead so it should go all the way to the other side period okay is that the case well obviously not you know we know <laughs> i mean anyone who's worked in the industry that if you put um uh, uh you know if you have a vacuum and again i talked about i worked in uh minus seven Tor range, which is high vacuum, okay? I've been seeing up to uh, minus eight range. We didn't work at that level because it's too much uh, time pumping the system and you don't need that kind of vacuum for the work that I did, you know, semiconductors. But we work typically in the five to the minus seven range, Tor, right, range. And that's high vacuum. And when you have high vacuum, you know, it, it, that is quite clean. Whatever, you, whatever electrons you shoot, right, have very little to bounce again to recombine, and they reach the other side, supposedly. In other words, there's electricity there, okay? 
and you have this plasma, okay? And so you're shooting through this plasma, essentially. And so you have electricity, but if you pump it down to five to the minus seven, well, you know, you don't have enough uh, current there to, to, um, create, uh, to create a connection. You don't have current. And what happens, you have to fill the vacuum chamber again with, with uh, we did it with argon, so that now you have some material with which to do what we did with sputtering or uh, what we called uh, ion implantation. So now you have some material in there. You have atoms and you can have a current. But if you remove all, the, all this uh, gas out of the system, you remove all the water, all the oxygen, anything that's in there, and you pump it down to 5 to the minus 7, you don't have a current. You do not have a current 5 to the minus 7 uh, torn. You say, well, maybe you, you got to shoot it harder. You got to have a bigger cannon. It's not a question of the cannon. It's a, it's a question of how much material you have inside the system. And for that, you need a connection. You need the bridge for that electron to move if you're going to talk about electron beads. You need a bridge. You cannot do electricity without a bridge. That's the issue. And yeah, we do have a bridge. And I uh, showed it the other day that we have the uh, all electron shells that are merged. Then you have a bridge because what well, you're not sending a little bead atom to atom. No, what you do is you have a torsion in situ. That's what you have. That's electricity. Anyways, uh, uh, what's interesting is the electric universe, one of the groups that loves to talk about electricity but never defined it. You know, here this is what they think of uh, the universe. They think it's all these filaments that are connected, they're connecting all the stars and everything, and they say, oh, all that's electricity, which is binding all those stars and, um, and uh, the universe as a whole. And so they call them filaments, but see what you're staring at, according to them, is electricity flowing through there. But the problem is they're going to do this electricity with discrete beads. And one of the issues there is whether this is alternating current or direct current. That's one issue you should ask the <laughs> the famous uh, electricians of the electric universe. I mean, is electricity flowing only in one direction from anode to cathode? Which star is the cathode? Which one's the anode? That's one issue. And then the other issue is, uh, you know, all these discrete beads, the electron beads with which they work, you know, uh, they're not tied to each other. Why would one follow the other one? Why would one bead follow the, uh, the other one? You know, why don't they uh, swerve in space? I mean, after all, all, this, uh, all these stars, all these galaxies, they're all in motion. So, you know, all these beads should be describing arcs in, uh, in space. They should be moving in, um, in curves, okay? And here's another vision of their uh, uh, filament universe. <laughs> and they love this stuff because they say, oh, see, this proves that electricity does flow from one galaxy to another. And so they show you this stuff and, and they try to convince you through visual effects that this is exactly what the universe is. It's just a bunch of electricity flowing through these filaments. And that's what they believe in, okay? That's the world we have out there in the so-called mathematical science world. Okay, um, one fellow asks, he says, and this is, takes us into the subject matter also, using your drill analogy, okay? Uh, would the following be true? Speed of the drill bit voltage. Uh, spinning in one direction, direct voltage. Spinning in one direction than the other, alternating voltage. Size of the drill bit current, more electron shell spinning. Well, the problem is <laughs> you're, you're confusing voltage with current, with electricity. Okay? Voltage is not really electricity. It's one aspect of electricity. The electricity is supposedly the flow of beads in the case of quantum mechanics, which, again, is not voltage. And in the case of the rope model, again, we have torsion of the uh, bound electron shells, which we call a serpentine. We have all these electron shells that are bound to each other in a long string, and that string we call a serpentine. The whole serpentine is twirling in situ, okay? So that's what it is. So we're not talking about voltage. It's direct current or alternating current. We're talking about current, electricity, okay? And uh, you should be talking about direction. Why talk about spin in direction, spin in that direction? Talk about clockwise, counterclockwise. Mother Nature then understands you. See, if you say the, the thing is turning clockwise or the thing is turning counterclockwise, Mother Nature understands you. But if you say direction, some people say, well, is that the north direction? Is it the south direction? In which direction are we pointing? So don't use the word direction because you're talking about orientation, how something is pointed or whatever. No, talk about clockwise and counterclockwise. Very simple. Don't talk about positive or negative because we have no idea what positive or negative is. No one has ever defined in physical terms what positive and negative are. Okay? These are just labels that they put in there saying this one's different than that one. And you could say this one's opposite to that one. And still we haven't learned anything because we don't know what's physically occurring at these terminals. But with clockwise and counterclockwise, straightforward. And uh, so just let me one more time go through the voltage thing so this fellow understands. Okay, this is voltage according to quantum mechanics. And what it is is um, what these people uh, believe is that little beads are moving along the wire. 
Okay, and what they do is they have them moving in a straight line, when in fact they know that these things spiral. And it turns out that they don't move like we said the other day. They say the electrons really move very little, almost in situ. And also spiraling because they're spiraling and moving in situ. Boy, that's giving us a clue what electricity is, really. And so the electrons don't really move. They're spiraling. And so, you know, if you put them together, well, you end up with the rope model, which is this one. You're saying what we're saying here is that, you know, you have all these serpentines made of uh, merged electron shells and they're spinning around in situ. And what we see at the opposite ends is what we call voltage, which is just a clockwise and counterclockwise uh, uh, instigation or, uh, you know, you're, you're essentially uh, triggering something to happen. In, in this case, uh, this is the simple lead battery. What we're saying is what's happening there is there's a chemical reaction that's causing this effect. Okay, simple. You can see past videos where I talked about it. But anyways, the point here is that uh, it's different than electricity under the rope model is simply the torsion in situ of electron shells, which are merged. And that's more or less how quantum mechanics uh, describes it after you put them against the wall. First, they show you this uh, beads rolling around. Then when you put them against the wall, they say, well, it's not really the beads rolling around. What it really is that they move very little and they move in circles locally. And so what they're doing is describing really the rope model, which is the electron shells moving in situ. But before we can say that, uh, obviously, we have to uh, figure out what an electron is, because either an electron is a little bead that uh, moves around the atom, or it's what we say it is, which is a membrane, a balloon that encapsulates the, uh, uh, the, atom, the, the uh, nucleus of the atom, okay? Okay, so here, uh, continuing so that we get to the final point here that we're trying to make today. Uh, here we have a fellow, he says, uh, stroboscope, uh, laser photography, we observe the electron. <laughs> we observe the electron. We can't even observe an atom, he says, we observe the electron. And he says also, he said, we observe no indication of invisible intangible ropes. So let's address that first. And there you see, by the way, the, that's the electron that was filmed supposedly by the people in Sweden, one, one university in Sweden. They claimed to the world, oh, we were able to film an electron. What the hell are we staring at? If we can't even see an electron, we can't see an atom. And they saw an electron. And I'm sure they're going to see gluons and quarks and whatever, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so we can't see it, but they filmed it. They see it. That's an electron. My God. And uh, so let's go first with the first issue there, uh, or uh, the one that, uh, second issue, I'm sorry, the invisible and intangible. Uh, apparently this fellow, um, you know, he must be uh, English as a second language. Maybe he's uh, 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 one of these illegal ignorance. <laughs> and so here it is. Let's, let's explain what these words mean. Okay, invisible, not visible, not perceptible by the eye, invisible fluid withdrawn from or out of sight, hidden. And just in case, let's define visible, because if not visible, what do you mean by that? Well, visible, that cannot be seen. Percept uh, perceptible to the eye. Visible means that it can be seen. It's perceptible to the eye. Invisible means the opposite. It cannot be seen. Okay, so, uh, yeah, if it's an invisible rope, I don't know what you're doing, straining your eyes, trying to see it. Why are you straining your eyes? You can't see it because it's invisible. <laughs> So what part don't you understand? Again, you know, illegally ignorant, uh, maybe. And then we have uh, intangible. Well, what is intangible? Well, it's not tangible. That's what it means. Intangible means not tangible. It means what? Incapable of being perceived by the sense of touch. You can't touch it. Just in case, you know, tangible, capable of being touched. So if, if you can touch it, it's called tangible. If you can't touch it, it's called intangible. And uh, what is touch? To put hand, finger, etc. on or onto in contact with something. So... Again, I don't know what this fellow is trying to do. He's trying to touch or see that which is intangible and invisible. You know, I don't understand that. Uh, why is he breaking his head on something that is untouchable, unseeable? And he says, oh, I can't see or touch it. No kid. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> okay, uh, but where does this take us? Well, it takes us to this, to the size of the electron, okay? It says that it is concluded that the diameter, these, this is from our good old friend, uh, Arthur Compton. 100 years now, 1919, okay? And they tried to figure out what was the diameter, the size of the electron. And listen to the numbers. That'll give you a clue of how big an electron is. And maybe it'll give you a clue why we can't see it and why uh, this uh, fellow who says, you know, we can observe in, uh, and, uh, an electron with whatever uh, uh, stroboscope or laser photography. Uh, no, I don't think so. Not an electron. 
And, and here you have first uh, Arthur Compton, and he says, it is concluded that the diameter of the electron is comparable in magnitude with the wavelength of the shortest uh, gamma rays. Using the best available values for the wavelength and the scattering by matter of hard X-rays and gamma rays, the radius of the electron is estimated. He's estimating 1919, okay? This is just an initial estimate, okay? As about 2 times 10 to the minus 10 centimeters. Okay, so this was his conclusion at the time. What has happened since then? Well, they did a lot more experiments, right? A lot of more calculations, etc. This is out of the Wikipedia today. The upper bound of the electron radius of 10 to the minus 18 meters can be derived using the uncertainty relation in energy. Just a calculation. They've never seen it. They can't see it. No, no equipment will ever see an electron. But they're saying, okay, look, we know at least that that's the upper bound, 10 to the minus 18 meters. Okay, because up to that point, we can't see it. <laughs> okay, and then uh, in Cora, we have all these verses. This is so funny because, you know, everybody's an expert, and it turns out they all have different opinions and nothing but. It has no structure, even if you probe it with a scope with a resolution of 10 to the minus 18 meters. Great. Another guy says, all experiments done so far uh, show it to be point size. Uh, it has zero size. That's what point size means. Okay, so how big is an electron? It's zero size. Okay. And they say that's according to the experiments. In other words, they've never seen one. And this fellow says, let's, let me put it here so that we can see it. This fellow says that uh, what they have been able to observe an electron. And the last guy says, in quantum scale, the scale in which electrons belong to neither physical size nor mass do not matter much. And I think he said it right. In other words, they don't care because they can't see it and they don't care anyways. It's, it's, it's not uh, in their job description, the mathematicians to see it. Okay. That's not their job to draw it or whatever. They, so they can give you whatever nonsense, tell, they can tell you whatever nonsense and get away with it. Okay, that's the issue. Because they don't care. A mathematician doesn't care about architecture, about structure, about bodies. He just wants calculations, numbers, values. That's, what, that's his job uh, function. Okay, so that's the problem. He's not a physicist. He calls himself a mathematical physicist, but he's not a physicist at all. Okay, okay and here we have... Uh, Fowl says, uh, atomic force microscope, mi microscopy, we see atomic bonding. Not only we see electron, now we see the bonds. <laughs> uh, the bonds is what bonds two atoms, let alone molecules, but you can bond also atoms. And he's saying we, they can see the bonds. Man, in God's eyes or God's microscope, I don't know. And we are observing the effects of vacuum energy. Now you don't not only observe energy, which is a concept, you're observing the effects of energy. I guess he's observing the real things that he can observe, which can be experimentally observed. Yeah, I mean, you can, in, in experiments, you can go to the lab and see the visible, tangible things, maybe, right? But you cannot see the invisible and intangible things, you know, like gravity, whatever that is, uh, the mediator of light, whatever that is, uh, the mediator of magnetism, you know, those things you cannot see or touch for some strange reason. Okay, and here's a, a prime example uh, nitrogen atom, that's probably the best picture they ever got of an atom. Okay, and using atomic force microscope, uh, this organization there, they were able to get a uh, an image. Remember, this is as you can see there, they're, they're pixels. And it's like they construct the thing pixel by pixel. Okay, so that's what's happening here. They're they're going in there and with light, playing around with light, with a wavelength of light. Okay, they were able to build little by little this image, which is probably the best image we've got of an atom, supposedly and an atom on top of a uh, piece of uh, uh, copper. Okay, and that's a nitrogen atom. Now, a nitrogen atom is at least 14 times as big as a hydrogen atom. It's, uh, you know, you got seven protons, seven neutrons there, essentially, right? So you got 14, it's the atomic weight 14, okay? And uh, so the question is, if, if this is the best we can see, is it possible to see this bond that this guy says between two atoms, between two molecules, the bond? I mean, what is a bond? Okay, and here you have them. This is the way they illustrate them, okay? Uh, you see that they put all these carbon and nitrogen and hydrogen uh, atoms, and they, they unite them or they bind them with this bond. And you can see the hydrogen bond there. They put a, a dotted line because they don't know what it is. And you see in the, in the carbon there, in the carbon uh, uh, atoms that, that are connected, they just put a little line. So where do you find these lines in the standard model? What are these bonds, okay? And so this is the issue. They, they put them in there by hand, but they, by, <laughs> you never find them in the standard model. And so you say, well, what is this hydrogen bond? I mean, is it a physical entity? Is it a stick? Is that what a bond is? So if you can't see an atom, okay, like this guy there, right, or barely see it, how can you tell me that you're going to see a, an, a, a, an electron or even a bond that connects two atoms? In fact, in, in many cases, they say the electrons are connected by a bond. 
So the bond is, if you can't see an electron, let alone a bond. And this guy's talking about, oh, yeah, we've seen them, we've imaged them, you know, et cetera. And he really believes that, uh, you know, that they've seen electrons and bonds. And they show him like uh, that little movie of the electron, blue electron, you know, waving and so on. You, oh, you know, and they, they really buy it. You can sell them the uh, Empire State Building twice. <laughs> Okay, so for this, we have to look at the electron. What is an electron? Well, they say it's an elementary point particle. Those are the terms that they use for electron. You look at elementary particle or fundamental particle, and it says a subatomic particle that is not composed of other particles. So the buck stops there. It, it's a particle that's not comprised of anything smaller, meaning that is the uh, uh, last particle of quantum. And, you know, again, the uh, reporter at the end of the room says, uh, what is it made out of? And the guy says, well, give us more money and we'll break it up and we'll tell you what it's made out of. The electron is made out of the Z particles. <laughs> so all the, uh, so, so quantum mechanics has a, is, is, uh, is job security because all you need to do is break up whatever particle and you find a new particle and then they say, well, what's that particle made out of? Well, give us more money and we'll break it up and we'll tell you what that's made out of. And all they do is, you know, stamp collecting. They say the electron is made out of the Bs and if you smash the Bs hard enough, then and those are made out of As or maybe out of Zs. And they give them just names. And you, they keep going and going and going and going down the line. That's all they have. And so what is it? Uh, stamp collecting. We, we have no explanation how, for how this universe works, but they keep inventing all these particles, you know, the so-called particle zoo. And right now, they, they stopped at the electron because it's so small, they can't even break that one up. <laughs> okay, so, so it's like the end of the line for quantum. They, they can't see it. They can't break it up. So what do we do now? We stop physics because these people have reached the end of the line. And then a point particle, what is that? An idealization of particles heavily need, used in physics. Yeah, unfortunately, not in physics, in mathematics, maybe. Its defining feature is that it lacks spatial extension. An object that doesn't have spatial extension. Being dimensionless, it does not take up space. Sounds like they're talking about something that has no volume, no, no size at all. A point particle is an appropriate representation of any object whenever its size, shape, and structure are irrelevant in a given context. Meaning that that's what the mathematicians use all the time. They use words such as energy, field, mass, and so on because they don't care about the objects. They care about all these concepts. So you're never going to find uh, a physical object in mathematical physics. All you're going to find is all these concepts, mathematical concepts, which they converted into objects. They concretize them, concretize them or whatever it's called. Uh, they, they reify them. Yeah, that's what happened. They reified concepts. Okay, so here we have it. Uh, Go on the other side. Give me a second here. Where do you go? Okay, here you have the electron according to uh, another fellow. You know, he's got a different notion of what the electron is. He doesn't think of it as a particle. He's trying to explain to you <laughs> what an electron is. And this is what he goes through. He says, electron is, in quantum mechanics, have a wave function. Oh, my God, the wave function again. Okay, This describes the probability distribution of the electron. So we have an electron, it has a wave function, meaning a wave function tells you the distribution of the electron within the wave function. The wave function supposedly is this region, and you're going to find the electron in that region, which more or less you get the picture right at the bottom there, okay? And so it says, uh, continues, it says, uh, how likely you are to find it in a particular place, okay? Quantum mechanics means that nothing in the universe knows where the electron is inside the wave function before one looks for it. Well, that's strange. You would think that uh, every object in the universe has a location, irrespective of whether anyone's looking for it. I mean, does uh, an electron uh, acquire a location only when God looks at it? And when God's not looking, it doesn't have a location? What do you mean by that? It, it has to have a location at some point. Every object in the universe must have a location, whether you're looking at it or not. It's got nothing to do with the observer. And again, that's why we take the observer out of the picture. There are no observers in science. All objects exist and have a location irrespective of the observer. The observer is only a question of knowledge, not an issue of, uh, of where the object really is on, on its own. Okay? Hopefully you have a, a location irrespective of whether anyone's looking at you. And hopefully atom, every atom in your body has a location, right? And hopefully every electron within every atom has a location. And to say that, you know, all we have to do is take a snapshot of the universe, stop the universe, and look at your atoms. Boy, they had better have a location with respect to each other for a given cross-section of time. So don't tell me that they don't have a location. What is an object that doesn't have a location? 
it's an object that doesn't exist that's what it is because what's existence object with location <laughs> so okay so well it says that he again he talks about no knows knowledge right the wave function of electrons around an atomic nucleus sort of look like an inflated balloons like inflated balloons and there he's got a picture of it okay well that sounds a lot or looks a lot like what we have in uh, the rope model so let's look at the rope model of that same water molecule there and here it is okay that's what our molecule looks like yeah we're talking about balloons so their their famous water molecule yeah we think it's just a balloon bunch of balloons that are bound to each other they're merged the shells the electron shells the electron membranes electron balloons they're merged with each other and that's what an atom is and in this case a molecule so you know we do have a solution for it all we have to do is get rid of the notion of discrete particles that's it as long as you do it with particles you're never going to figure this out and that's what they've been doing for the last ten thousand years okay okay so here are my conclusions okay for today not that we stopped on the subject okay but conclusions qm quantum mechanics electron is, uh, says it's equal to no size it's a point particle okay uh it has no subcomponents it's an elementary particle meaning it's it's not made of anything okay so it is an indivisible particle and they would say up till today <laughs> tomorrow we don't know maybe we get a big atom smasher electron smasher and we can tell you what it's made out of but right now we we can't figure it out through experiments so we're going to say it's a elementary particle not made of smaller constituents okay but the other guy says electron is really a wave function or where you can find the electron within the wave function whatever that means i mean you know <laughs> what is that it's just telling you that it's in this region okay so i don't care if it's in that region hopefully all my electrons right are in this region right and if and if we could stop the universe for a second get a cross section of time i'm sure god could go in there and pinpoint where all my electrons are hopefully because nothing's moving at that moment in time except him <laughs> right or maybe electron every electron with respect to him but he can more or less pinpoint every electron so hopefully every electron in the universe has a location at a given cross section of time okay zero time right uh, so what's a wave function? Well, a function is an equation, a formula. So what are they talking about? They're saying it's in this region, uh, and we can calculate it. We can calculate what the region looks like. Again, meaningless. We, we don't care where it's at. What are we going to do with it? What is an electron? Is it a bead? We haven't shown that yet. Uh, so uh, electron, so far, the quantum electron is not an object, not a thing, until they can tell you or define it as such as a thing, point to it. But if they're going to say it's zero dimensional, has no volume, no size, what are you going to point to? You know, point to nothing? Yeah, you're pointing to space, <laughs> vacuum. And uh, it, yeah, the electron, according to quantum mechanics, is just a mathematical concept. That's what they deal with. So whenever you ask a question of objects, whenever you ask a question of how something works and they're going to use the electron, they're introducing a concept and they're going to uh, pitch it to you as a physical object. That's where the problem is. And um, under the rope model, very simple. Uh, the electron is a membrane. It encapsulates the proton. And that's going to be the subject of my next lecture.